I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9.08, Wednesday, February 3rd. This is the TDN Writer's Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And here in the Northeast, we got walloped by snow on Monday. And you know, the only thing I hate worse than snow is these people that say how much they love snow. Like, why would anybody like snow? I was stranded for an entire day. I literally couldn't go anywhere. Um, give me Florida, give me 72 and sunny every single day. No, this is no good. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And somebody told me the other day that it was Groundhog Day. And I was like, 300 straight. Who, who knew the difference? And Bill, I think, yeah. was, I think people only hate snow who have to drive. I don't drive anywhere. So it's all good for me. I just go out and play with my dog. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I was stranded for a day. It was just awful. It's like, you know, being in prison. Ugh. I don't think it's being in prison. Believe me, I haven't been in prison, but I'm sure that your apartment is a lot nicer than being in prison. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you know so much about prison, John? You know, well, we are in the racing industry, so you know there are some nefarious things that go on occasionally. I've actually interviewed people in prison during during my writing career, which is a true story. So, yeah. so I've I've sort of I've sort of done my time. Okay. And they were like, "This is bad," but have you ever been trapped inside by the snow? That's <laughs> right, in Oceanport. <laughs> oh man! The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. A reminder that wagering through Keeneland Select supports Keeneland's efforts to give back to the thoroughbred industry, as profits are reinvested back into the sport through purses, fan development, player rewards, and more. Sign up at KeenelandSelect.com. Keeneland just released their spring stake schedule yesterday. There'll be 18 stakes. The meet starts April 2nd and runs through April 23rd. The biggest day of the meet is April 3rd, which will feature the $800,000 Toyota Bluegrass and the Central Bank Ashland, both 100-point preps for the Kentucky Derby and the Kentucky Oaks, respectively. So, like I said last week, Keeneland's spring meet will be here before you know it. So get involved at KeenelandSelect.com. Okay, so we start this week with some sad news. Um, John Forbes passed away earlier this week at the age of 73, uh, really one of the most instrumental figures in the history of, of New Jersey racing. Um, he, was, he, he was crucial to creating the Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association at large, but then the, the NJTHA, he was especially instrumental in creating and um, has, has a reputation as an innovator and, and, and a great guy and was a great trainer as well before he got involved in horsemen's issues. And, you know, if you just, you, all you have to do is look at the, uh, at the post of his obituary on the TDN website and look at all the positive comments and, and look at all the replies on social media that he clearly touched a lot of people's lives. I didn't know him personally, but I, I do know um, his widow, Vicky, who is the director of customer service at the TDN and is, you know, possibly the nicest, most genuine person I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, definitely, definitely top five for sure. And I know that she's been been dealing with uh, his his cancer treatment for a while. And, and my deepest condolences go out to, to Vicky and their their children and their grandchildren. It's obviously um, a very 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 tragic thing. But you know, I think the the one the positive that can be taken away is is the impact that he clearly had on so many people's lives or so many people that, that are telling stories about him this week. Um, so I, th I think that, you know, obviously, even though it's a, it's a tragic thing, that that impact that he had on people is going to live forever. Um, and I think that that's all you can like. That's all you can ask for a life well lived. So so rest in peace to John Forbes and, and condolences to the entire family. Uh, I'm going to toss it over to Bill and John, who knew him a little bit better than me. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I mean, I literally knew John for about 40 years and. Uh, you know, going way back to when I was a teenager hanging out at Monmouth Park and, and betting the, the horses there. I have so many thoughts on him. I don't really necessarily know where to start. Um, but I think one thing I, I want to put out there is, you know, you think about a horse trainer. The, the, John Forbes was a horse trainer and he was one of the greatest horse trainers ever in the history of New Jersey racing. But that title didn't define him, horse trainer, as it defines so many others. He was so much more than that. I mean, even before he got into the Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, I mean, he had his hand in everything. Uh, you know, he was on top of all the issues. He wanted to change things. He wanted to be involved. He was never going to stand pat, whether it was horse racing or anything else, if he thought, you know, there was injustice being done or somebody wasn't doing it right. So look what he accomplished above and beyond 
uh, the, the career as a trainer. Like you said, all the work with the New Jersey Horsemen's Association. And there's an offshoot to that story that you just told about him or defining him or explaining about the Horsemen's Association. It, it's quite possible that Lamoth Park would not be here today if not for John Forbes, that back in the day, uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago, or whatever it is, um, everyone's favorite, least favorite governor in the history of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie, the state owned the tracks, and, and and I don't, I can see why they were losing a lot of money. He said, "We're getting out of the racing business. I'm closing both Monmouth Park and the Meadowlands." And you've got, you know, a, a, a business that's losing money in a sport that's not growing, and you know, getting Monmouth sold and getting it into new hands was no easy thing. And along with Dennis Brazen, John Forbes was instrumental in working out a deal with the government where the Horsemen's Association took over the track and leased it from the state. And you know, would Monmouth have survived without him? Maybe. But again, maybe not. Uh, and, he, you know, he rolled up his sleeves and got that done. And it's not hyperbole to say that he might have saved New Jersey racing. The other thing, um, and maybe we'll get a chance to get to back this because I don't want to hog the spotlight. I want to turn it to John. But from uh, a journalist standpoint, I love talking to John, but with a caveat. If you came with your notebook to John's barn at nine o'clock, expect to leave at two o'clock. You'd ask one question. And an hour and a half later, uh, John, you, you know, like, take a deep breath, come up for air. Um, but, you know, that was because he was such an interesting guy and had so much to say. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you wanted a quick little 15 second sound bite, you did not go by the John Forbes barn. Now, you know, Bill, you're absolutely right. And, and, and one of the reasons I think why John, you know, talked so much is because he loved the sport. He loved the industry. He loved the horses and he loved the people that he got to be associated with, you know, throughout his career, um, mostly in New Jersey. And, you know, you say your, your relationship with John spans, you know, four decades. Mine's not quite as long, but it was, it, mine started when I would argue, you know, it was the era of the golden age of Monmouth Park. It was when, um, you know, Craig Perrette, Herb McCauley, and Chris Antley were leading the standings in the, in the mid 80s. And you had owners like Glenn Lane and Ebby Novak from New Farm and, and Joe Pierce. And then the trainers, the leading trainers at Monmouth were all phenomenal horsemen, um, but quality people also. It was, you know, you had John Mazza and Willard Thompson and Danny Pearlswig and then, you know, Jimmy Kroll and John Forbes. And, and the thing that, that, you know, when I look back at that era and I think of those people who were involved and, um, you know, just how much they meant to New Jersey racing and also East Coast racing, um, it, it really took me back. And I remember one story specifically about John Forbes, you know, back then we had a claiming operation and we were constantly in battle with the leading owners, uh, you know, like, like Joe Pierce and, uh, and Peter Shannon. And, um, and I remember at one point in time at the Meadowlands, the cold, you know, December, uh, cause back then the Meadowlands actually ran all the way through New Year's and we were running an allowance race with one of our better fillies and one of John Forbes Philly has finished a very close second to ours. And then the winter came and, and we, you know, sent our horses elsewhere. And um, I think John gave his Philly some time off and he brought her back at Monmouth Park Memorial Day weekend and ran her for 40,000, which at the time was the top claiming race, claiming ranks. And I remember looking at her in the paddock and saying, wow, she's really put on weight. She's dappled out. She looks great. And we ended up claiming her. The short story at this point is the Philly ended up winning. And one pretty convincingly, we claimed the horse and we were high-fiving in the owner's box because we were very excited about this filly. And John, you know, went to the winner's circle, took the picture, walked up to where the owner's boxes were and walked over to us. And I thought he was going to lay into us. How could you do that? How could you claim my horse? You know, we gave her time off, blah, blah, blah. And he walked over and he said, good job, guys. I wish you the best of luck. And if I can tell you something that I think will help you, um, this filly loves hot mash. And at the time I was like, you know, what do you mean? He said, we couldn't get weight on her. And we finally figured out that if you heat her feed in the morning, she'll eat up and lick the tub clean and she'll do better. Now, he did not have to do that to tell us the key as to why the filly got better and looked better. Um, he could have just easily have not said anything, walked off. And three weeks later, when she wasn't eating, we would have dropped her in a claiming race and he could have claimed her back and then, you know, reestablished her career. But the class and honor and integrity that he showed to make sure that 
the horse itself was taken care of to the best of, the, of, of its ability, even though it wasn't in his barn anymore, still to this day resonates with me. It still to this day is something that I'll always remember about, you know, John Forbes and the way that he handled himself and the way that he made sure that horses were taken care of first. And in this day and age, I just don't think that happens very much. So it resonated with me. I think it's, it was worthwhile to hopefully tell that, that story um, just to, again, express upon the honor and the integrity that the man had. Hey, John, I, if you don't mind, uh, Joe, I want to uh, tag uh, what John just said. And when when I learned of the passing of John Forbes, I, I thought more about not just about John Forbes, but and John, you just touched upon this Mammoth Park as a whole. And Joe, you're a little bit too young to remember this. John's about 10, 12 years older than me. So he'll definitely, um, <laughs> if we look back at it. But you had in this golden era, you had, and, and John mentioned most of them, um, but guys like Willard Thompson, Joe Pierce, um, especially Jimmy Kroll, uh, Bud Letman, stuff like that. You had in this golden era of Mammoth Park, this, I mean, 10, 15, 20, just wonderful trainers, old school guys, great horsemen. Um, and a lot of them probably could have gone to New York and, you know, move their careers forward, made more money, get better stables. But I think most of these guys stayed because of their love of Monmouth Park and New Jersey racing. And that certainly fits in with John Forbes. I mean, he didn't have to be the leading trainer at Aqueduct. He didn't have to win the Kentucky Derby. Obviously, he would have liked to. He was obviously content what he had being a, a big gun in New Jersey racing. And with the, we lost John Mazza last year, and or maybe even a little bit earlier this year, and now we lost John Forbes. I think John was the last living link to that era, and that that is is really sad. I, you know, we know things change, but and you know sometimes change is good, sometimes it's not. We love Monmouth Park, but you know, and, and again, John, I, I think will back me up on this. You know, people at our age group look back at the, the good old days of Monmouth Park and and wonder, you know, where did they go? It's kind of a shame. Yeah, I mean, and, and it seems like John, if they ever want to build a statue of anybody at Monmouth, John Forbes would be the guy. I mean, he's, he, like I said, he's, he's, he's so instrumental to New Jersey racing and to Monmouth. Just wanted to mention a couple of the other things, very notable things in, in his career, with, uh, which st starts, I think, with Tail of the Cat. Um, he, he and his, his longtime assistant, Pat McBurney, who now is one of the top trainers at Monmouth, um, in 95, they formed a partnership uh, to, to buy, buy yearlings, and they were immensely successful at that. The most successful one was Tail of the Cat, who they bought for 375000 and he went on to win the, win the King's Bishop at Saratoga. He was second in the Whitney, and they ended up selling him for $11.7 million, and he became a very successful stallion at Coolmore. I mean, he's still pumping out good horses. Um, so, so that, 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 that shows what kind of horseman he was as well. Also mini golf. He was, he was a huge mini golf guy and created, um, a course at Monmouth park that ended up hosting the U S open and mini golf several times. He was uh, inducted at them into the mini golf hall of fame. Um, and I just wanted to, to mention, uh, that the family in lieu of flowers is requesting donations in John's name to the backstretch community assistant program. Um, assistance program, which is a program that assists New Jersey horse racing stable employees in the areas of counseling, health, education, recreation, and benevolence. Um, you can read more about them in the in the John Forbes obit. But uh, yeah, so 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 great stories uh, from you guys, and I um, want to say sorry for your loss as well because you knew him. Um, clearly, someone who touched so many people in the industry, but especially in New Jersey racing. And and I think I think Bill is point is poignant that you know he, he may have been one of the last links to, to old time Monmouth Park and it really is such a special place you know um being being a New York kid I, I I've been to Monmouth Park several times and it really like Saratoga it's one of those places that you feel like you're going back in time you know it's just it's it's this this quaint old track that really transports you um and it, you know it's, it seems like it, it would not exist today as it does really, if it wasn't for John Forbes. So um, again, condolences to, to Vicki and the entire family. And uh, we're, we're thinking of you guys. And, and Bill, one one last thing to put the bow on it. I, I couldn't find it when I was doing research, but can you remember out of, you know, he, he won 2,100 races and 14,000 starts. Do you remember any of his horses ever testing positive? 
No, not at all. Yeah, not I, at all, right? I mean, that just wasn't that just wasn't the way. And and you know that era also just you know is kind of long gone as far as you know what things they did to try to help horses. They did it with horsemanship. They did it with you know with, with their own brain and sitting there in front of the stall and watching horses on the shed row and just picking up on the nuances of idiosyncrasies that horses have. And I think that that's a lost art also in in the industry now. Um, so it, it, it's. It's the ending of, a, of an era, as, as Bill said, you know, with regard to uh, that the kind of golden age of Monmouth Park, but but also horsemanship and, and uh, you know, what went into making a horse better just by watching it and, and actually training and not being a chemist. Right, exactly. Totally agree, John. Okay, so derby prep season churns on. Um, we had the Holy Bull Stakes over the weekend um, at, at Gulfstream, as well as the Robert Lewis at Santa Anita. Uh, two pretty interesting prep races for different reasons. Uh, I'll start with the Holy Bull. You know, greatest honor was the dominant winner for Suge McGahee and Jose Ortiz. He's the kind of horse that I think you know kind of benefited from not breaking his maiden early. You know, if he's, you know, we, we talk about Shug McGahee and trainers like him who like to train their horses into racing shape. And and he got to run four times in a maiden and basically, basically create, you know, this foundation that lets him jump from maiden race to graded stakes race, you know, with a plum. And I, you know, he, he ran four times, ran against some really good horses, ran against uh, Cattle River who won the Southwest last week and, and, and is really impressive. Uh, he, he ran against Speaker's Corner, who is is a pretty good-looking three-year-old for Bill Mott. Not sure where he is, but uh, ran some good races as a, as a two-year-old. Uh, he ran against Olympiad, who also is on the sideline, but is, is highly regarded. So he, I think he got kind of lucky in that it took him a while. It took him four starts to break his maiden, but then by the time he did, he was ready to jump into stakes company and, and he proved that on Saturday. I mean, he only got an 89 buyer, but again, like it's just, it's, it's more visually than anything. And, you know, he blew that field away. Uh, obviously I, it seems like he's, he's bred to, to go 10 furlongs. Great, great family um, by Tappet. Terrific female family. I'll, I'll run through the names in a little bit after I get your guys' impressions, but also I to mention the runner up in that race, Tarantino, who was, who had only run on turf thus far in his career. Um, and, and was up and dueling on a pretty fast pace and looked like he was going to give it up at the top of the stretch and then fought back in the stretch and had no, was no match for greatest honor, but was a clear second best in that race in his dirt debut. And I think that that was, that was pretty encouraging. No excuse for the Todd Pletcher horse prime factor. Um, the TDN rising star it was, you know, obviously only had run, had run once. And that kind of makes my point about Suge and, and, and greatest honor that, you know, even though they were both, they had both just come out of maiden wins, greatest honor had so much more foundation under him than prime factor. So I wouldn't write off prime factor, but he was, he was, he was definitely a no excuse, well beaten third in there. Um, and then Medina spirit showed a, showed a, a ton of fight in the Bob Lewis uh, battling back along the inside against two challengers the entire stretch, really never let him by, even though he was up on a fast pace and, you know, what else is new? Bob Baffert is completely loaded um, for the for the Derby Trail. It's another one for him. He ran, even the horse ran second to, to Life is Good, who we're, we're probably going to see in the San Felipe in a couple of weeks. Um, but those two, you know, I think the, the 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 visual result was was more important than the buyer figures that they got in that race. But I'll, I'll see what you guys have to say. Um, well, let's tackle the Holy Bull first, and then I'll let John go. Maybe we can get back to the Robert Lewis, because there, there's obviously things to talk about in both. Um, Joe, you're, you're right on in greatest honor, and there's a good analogy about uh, him having just broken his maiden versus prime factor. Uh, prime factor had to jump from six furlongs to a, a two-turn race. You know, it didn't have the foundation other than the one start, whereas greatest honor, you know, was brought along to progress by Shug McGahee and to get better through four starts. And one of the things about greatest honor to also like is, I mean, he is the reincarnation, at least his form is, of Orb. Or took four starts to break his maiden as well. You know, wasn't rushed to anything by McGahee. Instead of going in the uh, a stakes race, he went next in an allowance race, won that. So that's, you know, the equivalent of, of kind of what Greatest Honor did in the Robert B. Lewis. They went on to win the founder of the Florida Derby, Kentucky Derby. Is Greatest Honor as good as Orb? Well, we don't know yet. But, you know, this pattern has been established by McGahee. And he, he's, it's not just with Orb and this horse. You see it with, with so many of his horses. I mean, he's not going to send out any two-year-olds are going to win by 12 lengths first time out and run a 97 buyer. But, you know, 
know, get into their fifth, sixth start. They're really going to be hitting their stride. And they're usually, they just keep getting better all along. So I think it's fair to say maybe this horse hasn't even reached his peak yet. Uh, I realize, like you said, the 89 buyer is nothing to get too excited about, but especially with prime factor kind of throwing in a dud right now, he certainly seems the best to be the best of bunch in Florida. Yeah, and just to bridge our last conversation about old-time horse training, you know, with John Forbes, same can be said for Shug McGehee. Um, you know, here's a guy who, you know, even the betters know not to bet first time out. I mean, here's a horse that is bred about as well as, as you can see, a uh, you know, three-year-old be, being bred, uh, uh, you know, tap it out of uh, out of uh, half-sister to rags to riches and, and Jazeel. I mean, it's just, it doesn't get any more royal than that kind of pedigree. And he sent him out the last week of Saratoga going seven furlongs, which is a daunting distance for a first time starter, two year old at 16 to one ran third, came back a couple of weeks later, again, ran third at five to one. So still wasn't expected to necessarily win. Um, and then, you know, ran a good race going nine panels at Aqueduct and then finally broke his maiden, um, you know, at, uh, at, at Gulfstream. So the horses run at four different racetracks, four different, three different distances, and has accomplished a lot, especially in comparison to some of the key key horses that uh, Joe mentioned before of, of, of who he's battled against. I really like the horse. I mean, you know, an 89 buyer at this stage of the game is kind of in the, the bottom of the, if you took the top 10, it's kind of in the bottom third as far as speed figures go, but it almost doesn't matter. The horse is improving every single race. You can you know, based on the eye test, you can see it. And based on the numbers, 72, 77, 79, 83 buyer, and then 89 in the Holy Bull. So I think the horse is really rounding into form and doing it the right way. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is that, you know, Shug has opted not to run the horse on Lasix every single race. Um, now, a couple of them obviously couldn't do it as a two-year-old in some of the racing jurisdictions, but then decided, you know, definitely not going to run them in Lasix in a graded stake race at, at Gulfstream because you can't. And just the way that he's been managing this horse looks like that he really feels that the horse is going to round in the form in some of the bigger races. And, and Bill, you know, you're the in, in, intrepid, um, you know, uh, interviewer. Um, you stole my thunder with Orb. I actually had written down on the sheet um, comparison to Orb. So, you know, tip of the cap to you, because that was that was a lot of my talking points. Um, it, it, we're not even going to I think we're not even going to touch on necessarily the, uh, the the swale, even though drain the clock ran a very impressive race um, to me when you look at him. You know, you could make the argument that he should be undefeated if not for, um, you know, a broken iron in the uh, in, in the Delta Downs race uh, where, the, where the, you know, the jockey fell off. Um, but he looked very impressive in that race. Can he go an extra couple of panels? You know, he ran seven eighths. Can he go a mile or a mile and, and an eighth? Um, I don't really I'm not sure. I don't really think so. Um, but it was an impressive sprint race um, for him and an impressive victory in the swale. I wanted to to expand on on the point about uh, greatest honors pedigree because you know even if he's, he's not a Derby winner, not the Belmont is back to a mile and a half. Like if you want to if you want a Belmont horse, I don't know that you could find a better pedigree for going a mile and a half on the dirt in America. Now he's the first foal out of Tiffany's honor, um, who's a daughter of Better Than Honor, who was the Broomer of the Year in two thousand seven. She was a Graded Stakes winner, multiple multiple Grade, grade One placed. I was brood mayor of the year, obviously, because she produced rags to riches, who, who was the first filly in a million years to win the Belmont. And I thought, you know, I think is, is one of the best fillies of the 21st century thus far. But not just rags to riches. She produced Jazzle, who won the Belmont um, Casino Drive, who won, who won the Peter Pan and was was a, a Japanese horse that, that was pretty highly regarded. Uh, Man of Iron, who won the Breeders' Cup Marathon at a mile and three quarters. I mean, you just go down the, the list of the pedigree streaming, who was a grade one winner um, in the, the third damn blush with pride, won the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, she, she under her, her name are a bunch of really good horses. Peeping Fawn, who was a high weight, multiple group one winner overseas. September was a group one winner overseas. Uh, the Way You Are, who was a group one winner in France. Uh, Paris Lights, who won the Coaching Club American Oaks last year. I mean, just up and down the pedigree. It's 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 quality and distance. So you know that's that's what that's what you're looking for when you're looking for horses for three year olds that you're pretty sure can run ten to twelve furlongs. I mean, he's he, he's he's his pedigree is as good as it gets. Now on the flip side, Medina Spirit is like one of probably the most modestly bred horses you'll see on the Derby Trail. He's by Pratonico out of a, a mare by brilliant speed, which, you know, that's, that's why he sold for a thousand dollars. He sold for a thousand dollars 
as an OBS winter mixed yearling. And then he uh, was, was able to bump that up to 35,000 at the OBS July two year olds in training sale last year. Um, but it, I just thought that that uh, contradiction was, was pretty interesting. And, and it just goes to, to show you that, you know, talent is talent doesn't really matter who your, your damn and your forefathers were, but you know, as the distances get longer, I'm going to be leaning more towards a pedigree like greatest honors, um, especially with, with his running style as well. Yeah. I mean, the thousand dollar thing is just fascinating. And you also have that broken strong horse that won the Remsen who cost $5,000, but you know, how many thousand dollar horses go on to win great stakes races? Uh, Joe, uh, I mean, again, this is a horse, it's a long way to go, but there's an awful lot to like about Medina spirit, especially the way this race unfolded. And, you know, he got hooked up in a speed duel going 22 and four, 46 and three. And, you know, he needed to have quality to be able to get the job done. He dug down, he got the race won, and the two horses he dueled with finished last and next to last beaten about 20 lengths. So that shows, you know, what that pace scenario did to the other ones. Um, I'm wondering if the connections Baffert, et cetera, were real happy with the ride. Uh, you know, he kind of got lucky to win considering the kind of trip that he got, but you know, again, it, it's, it's the story. It just comes back to the same guy over and over and over again, Bob Baffert. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's five more out there that, that we don't even know about. We're not even thinking about uh, that, that are going to wind up on the Kentucky Derby trail and be serious horses. And can he win the Derby again? Well, we don't know, but he's got some very good horses and Medina spirit has come a long way from that thousand dollar horse. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't as impressed with, with that race as I was with some of the other preps or some of the other races that have come up over the weekend. Um, sure. Medina, you know, spirit did, fight off a couple of challengers, which was very impressive. Um, but, uh, you know, it was the slowest Robert Lewis win since 2011. And the only reason why it stopped in 2011 is because it was a different track surface at that point. So the, the you know, the numbers don't necessarily jive. Um, and is Baffert going to have a horse that's going to come up in the Derby? I mean, yeah, let's not go too far out on a, on a shaky limb, right? Of course, he's going to have a handful um, that will probably, you know, dominate some of these, you know, prep races and and end up, you know, on the program uh, and, and the entries for Kentucky Derby. Um, but I'm not sure that I would use a first or a second round draft pick on, on Medina Spirit in our contest. Wow. That's, I think that's a smoke screen. I, I, think, he, I think he's actually going to trade up to take Medina spirit. I think, I think he's, he's bluffing here. Um, but yeah, I just, I wanted to, to use that to segue into just a brief, uh, preview of what's, what's going on this weekend. Uh, more, more three-year-old preps, um, in the San Vicente at, at Santa Anita, which is a grade two and the Sam Davis, which is a grade three at Tampa. Tampa card looks, looks pretty good from a wagering standpoint. They, they do a good job at Tampa. They, first of all, they're very, I, I always recommend that, that horse players check them out because they have very horse player friendly takeout, uh, 15% pick fives and pick fours. They have an immaculate turf course. I think one of the, one of the most beautiful turf courses, um, in America. And, and John is, uh, is proven strategies running in the Tampa Bay. I'm just going to say proven strategies is going to run in the Tampa Bay stakes. Um, he's going to uh, make, make his next uh, race there. Um, ironically enough, guys, when you get me you talk about the golden age of Monmouth Park, it keeps coming up in this podcast. Um, we are using the ageless um, Jose Ferrer to ride our horse. And Jose actually won a, his first race with, I mean, he won, a, he won a race with us for the first time. It's probably the right way to say it. Um, back in 1985, if you can believe it. And now, you know, 80 years forward, he's going to be riding again. So um, it, it's really amazing that, uh, that that he is, you know, still in shape and still doing as well as he is at, at Tampa. He doesn't ride very many races, but man, he's got a killer winning percentage. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's always interesting to go back and, and old and damn and second damn PPs and see races from the nineties and see guys like Jose Ferrer that were riding back then and that are still doing it. So, so that's, that's, that says a lot about him and his longevity. Um, but it looks like a, it looks like a really good card, a bunch of big fields um, at Tampa on Saturday. I don't know that there's going to be any superstars that come out of the Sam Davis, but it's at least going to be a big field, probably 12 horses or so. Um, also the Withers is on Saturday uh, at, at Aqueduct, which is a mile and an eighth. It's the first, mile and an eighth prep race on the calendar. Uh, we'll have the, we'll have the risen star next Saturday, which is also um, at a mile and an eighth. So, so we have that to look forward to uh, in the San Vicente. I think there's, you know, just to pick up on that Baffert conversation and just how many big horses he has. There's a horse in there named concert tour, who was a TDN rising star, son of street sense, homebred for uh, Gary and Mary West and just ran really kind of an eye popping race. 
in his debut uh, was up on the pace and just, you know, well held by Joel Rosario the whole time. And then when he asked him, he just burst clear and had this really powerful looking stride. Um, so the San Vicente, which is at seven furlongs, as opposed to the rest of the preps around now, which, which are, which are two turn races, uh, he's he's going to get a little bit more of a, a steady progression towards the Derby, but he's definitely, I think, the horse to look for in that race. There's a couple other horses in there that are a little interesting, a couple blowout uh, California bred maiden winners uh, that, that that could challenge, but I think he's he's definitely the horse out of there that I'll want going forward, but we'll see how it goes. So we've got some three-year-old action still to come um, this Saturday. Obviously, the, the calendar is going to ramp up as, as we go along here in February until we do the uh, the fantasy draft at the end of the month. I, I know that's what everybody is, is was waiting for, and I, you know, all these races are just kind of a precursor so we can do our fantasy draft. The whole world will be watching. Um, but, yeah, so, so, so some stuff to look forward to this weekend, uh, but I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to have those kind of breakout performances uh, like we had like we had last week, at, at least with great, great Greatest honor, and then just before we put a put a bow on on last weekend's races, I wanted to mention Express Train, who won the the San Pasquale Stakes at, at Santa Anita for older horses. He's a horse I mentioned after he ran second in the in the Malibu behind Charlatan, obviously flattered Malibu, flattered Charlatan, just like Medina Spirit flattered. Life is good. Um, he's a horse that I think has still has forward to go, and he's he's a typical John Sheriff's trainee, I think, with this like kind of steady progression throughout his three-year-old year. And then you expect them to really burst forward as four and five-year-olds. That's kind of his MO as a trainer. He's not, not one that has him, has him cranked too early. Um, but he, he ran, I think a sneaky good race. He had a 100 buyer. He didn't win by a ton, but if you watch the replay, he looked completely uncomfortable for the first half mile of the race. He was tugging at the jockey, throwing his head around. And then suddenly like at the half, after a half mile, he switched off, got it together and was relaxed. And then once he got tipped out into the clear by Mike Smith, he, it was, it was kind of all she wrote again. Like I said, she, he didn't win by a ton or get a great figure, but just visually just to watch him seem to be struggling a little bit for the first half mile and then be able to turn it on like that. I think that he's, he is, is still developing and, you know, there aren't too many of them left, but you know, I think he's going to win a 10 for a long grade one at one, at some point. Probably this year, there are two at, at Santa Anita. You got the Gold Cup and the Santa Anita Handicap, which I don't I don't know that there are any terrors to worry about in the California Handicap Division. But then, of course, you have the Jockey Club Gold Cup later in the year in the Breeders' Cup Classic. So he of the other horses who ran this weekend, other than the three year olds, I think he's he's clearly the most interesting one in terms of making noise later in the year. John, yeah, and 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 the other thing that 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 kind of brought came to my attention with regard to the, the San Pasquale um, wasn't even the winner. I mean, and, and Joe, you mentioned express train was, was impressive in that race. Um, but what happened to King Guillermo, you know, in, and, and as far as the management of him, and, and again, as a manager of a stable, I'm, I, I constantly watch to see what decisions people make. And, and look, it's easy to look back 2020 hindsight and say, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. But, but here's a horse that ran first time out an uncle Mo that ran first time out going 500 furlongs. All right. Probably needed one. Then they shifted him to the turf and he won impressively. They ran him on the turf again in the stake race. He ran third. Then he got some time off and ran, you know, 50 to one in the Tampa Bay Derby. Granted, he won, but he was 50 to one. So you got to wonder why, why would you run in that race? Then they shipped him to Oakland, ran an okay second to, to you know, in, in the Arkansas Derby. Had time off. Um, we know that there were other races they were pointing for, but he needed to have some time off. Still, still managed him and trained him at Gulfstream, shipped him you know, 18,000 miles to, to Aqueduct to run the cigar mile where he ran bad, shipped them back to Gulfstream, breezed them a couple more times to Gulfstream, and then shipped them 18,000 miles west to run in the San Pasquale, um, where he was, you know, I guess he was, what, four to one, five to one in, in, in the race, and, and didn't run good again. So you just, you have to wonder, you know, what are they shooting for? Are their expectations too high for this horse? Um, would they be better off just kind of keep him at home and and letting him run in an easier race and kind of get his legs, you know, from under him again. He's a horse that has talent, but you just have to question the management style of him at this point. Is he? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he's on a plan to Saudi Arabia right now to run in the Saudi Cup. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, no, that's an interesting point that he's. I, I don't remember ever seeing a horse managed like him who started on turf, ran on dirt, had this big blowout win, 
then they decided to give him these this four and a half months almost break between his last prep and the derby. Obviously, they had that luxury last year with the spacing of the schedule, but um, it's just it it always seemed a little a little foolish to me that you wouldn't want you know a, a more seasoned horse heading into the derby. And then, like you said, he's he's, he's kind of been all over the place since then. Clearly, a horse who has some talent, but yeah, I, I agree with John that this is this is a pretty unorthodox schedule, and I don't think it's 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 done right by the horse, and you can tell by the results. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. All right, so we have a few updates this week on stories that we we, we touched on last week, which are, are are big deals, especially the first one, um, the HHR saga in in, in Kentucky right now. Uh, we touched on it last week that the Kentucky Supreme Court has ruled that HHR doesn't constitute paramutual wagering, so now they have to rely on the Kentucky legislature to come up with a law to get around that. Um, and there has been a bill introduced in the Kentucky State Senate, uh, Kentucky State Senator John Schickel and Kentucky Senate President Robert Stivers introduced Senate Bill 120 into the Kentucky State Legislature late Tuesday with the goal of keeping historical horse racing in Kentucky and ensuring the future of Kentucky's signature equine industry. Uh, there was, wasn't we didn't get text of the bill. We didn't, we didn't really get that many details, uh, but keep who has been the, the, the kind of the leading voice on this, the Kentucky equine education product uh, signaled their, their approval of it and, their gratitude that uh, this the Senate is working on this because if you remember there's that there's that quirk that the Senate only the Kentucky legislature only uh, meets for a certain amount of days and only until March 30th uh, so that's that's that it really decreases the the window here where we can, where we can get something done to to reinstate that revenue for, for 2021 um, says SB the story in TDN says SB 120 set to be heard in the Senate licensing and occupations committee at 11 AM tomorrow, Thursday, uh, February 4th. So obviously we all hope that this, this, this is shepherded through. Um, there are there, I think there are opposing forces in Kentucky. I, I made the joke before, like the, the family foundation or whatever, if, 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 they have, if there's family in the name of a, of a group, they're definitely trying to ruin your fun. Um, so this is, you know, there are, there are things, there are, there are obstacles here. I'm sure there are lobbyists or anti-gambling lobbyists um, that they're going to have to deal with, but you know, the, the, the horse racing industry is so integral to Kentucky. That's why I think this is like, this is a unique scenario where, you know, is compared to a situation like, Pennsylvania, where they were going to, you know, take away all those subsidies, like, you know, that's not, that's not integral and, and crucial to, to, I mean, it is for the horse business it's inter integral and crucial, but overall for the, for the Pennsylvania culture and the economy, it's not like it is in Kentucky where, you know, that's horses and bourbon, you know, that's, that's, that's what Kentucky is, is, is best known for. And I, I don't think that they're going to let the horse racing industry die on a vine. Like I understand why people are worried and why people are, are, are concerned and they, they have a right to be, but I think at the end of the day, horses and horse racing are just too important to Kentucky to let it wither away. And it's, it's too much of a point of pride for the state. And I think for the, for the legislators as well. So I, I would expect this to be resolved, you know, in the next, in the next month or two, we'll keep an eye on it and we'll keep updating but, uh, you know, it's obviously the, the, the big first step has been taken to introduce legislation to remedy the situation. Yeah, Joe, I mean, you're absolutely right about that and, and all the things you said. Uh, you know, this is something that's obviously very important to the Kentucky racing industry. If they were to lose this, it wouldn't mean the end of Kentucky racing. It would just be pretty healthy purse cuts from those gigantic purses they have now. 
especially at Churchill Downs. I too, you know, not being an expert on Kentucky politics, um, you know, I'm sort of giving an opinion without a lot of basis behind it. But, you know, common sense would say, just like you've said, that it's such an important industry in Kentucky that the, the politicians will come together and get this thing to pass. Uh, having said that, I don't think it's going to fly through and just be like a unanimous thing. And I, I think I said this uh, earlier when we were talking about this. Keep in mind the state you're, you're dealing with. Yes, horse racing and bourbon in Kentucky, but yes, also the church. And, you know, it's a very conservative state, a very religious state. And there's definitely going to be some uh, legislators out there that are going to vote against it because they don't want someone to, to hand them, uh, put a tag on them that they're pro-gambling. You know, oh my goodness, gambling, the family foundation, the family this or that. It was say, oh, isn't Congress or Senator so-and-so, Joe Blow, a terrible guy because he's pro-gambling. Guys don't want that to happen to them. And somebody might say that's going to affect my might affect my chances of getting reelected. But, you know, I, I don't think that's going to stop the thing. But it's not going to be, you know, completely smooth sailing. Yeah, I wonder, like, I, I haven't heard anything from Mitch McConnell or, or Rand Paul or any of these guys. Uh, I know Andy Bashir is is behind a fix is the governor of Kentucky, but I, I I don't know. I haven't heard, maybe I missed it, but I haven't heard uh, the Kentucky legislators at the national level um, really get behind, behind fixing this. Obviously they have a lot of other things that they're dealing with now, including inst- obstructing the new administration. But uh, <laughs> this is something that's, you know, that, that should, that should be important to, to, to them and, and their, uh, their careers is to take care of Kentucky and, and the racing industry. Um, but also before, just before we move on, I wanted to mention that Katie Ritz, uh, did a really good piece um, in today's CDN talking to people in Kentucky, both horsemen and, and, and otherwise about the, the, the day-to-day effects that this would have, this would have if, if they never get HHR back up and running again, because like, like I said last week, it, it doesn't just affect the racing industry, like any gambling revenue, it goes to a lot of good things like education programs in the state. So um, I, I think, you know, eventually they'll, they'll find a workaround, but I just wanted to shout out Katie for that story. Cause that's, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, racing media needs to on that kind of on the ground reporting. So good job by her. Um, just the other the other story I wanted to to follow up on from last week was Nick's go. Uh, Bill talked to Brad Cox. Um, we spoke last week about the prospective Nick's go Charlottetown matchup in the Saudi Cup. It looks like we're going to get it now. Um, it, Brad Cox said he's he was looking for a reason not to run him back in in four weeks, but he hasn't. The horse hasn't given him one, which I find a little ridiculous that you're looking for a reason not to run in a twenty million dollar race. Like I, it's, I, I understand what he's saying that he he wants to put the horse first, but um, I think I think. You know, that was the first thing they thought about after the Pegasus was, can we run in the Saudi Cup for $20 million? But I thought the interesting thing, too, that that he said, and I'll, I'll let Bill expound on this um, if he wants, but that he's planning, if the horse runs well in the Saudi Cup, just keeping him over there and running him in the in the Dubai World Cup. He said that he's telling everybody to pack uh, for, for at least a month. Um, that's going over there. So uh, we're going to, it looks like we're going to get that matchup. It's going to be probably one of the best matchups of the year. Um, so just wanted to see if Bill had anything to add. Yeah. I mean, first of all, the Dubai World Cup, that was interesting. Um, but, you know, why wouldn't you run in the Dubai World Cup? You're already over there in, in you know, the, that neck of the woods. The ship might be something equivalent. I, I don't know the, the mileage. It might be like shipping a horse from Finger Lakes to Belmont or something like that. I don't think it's much harder than that. And it's also worth $12 million. Um, I think one thing that's so interesting about the Saudi Cup is not just that it's got these two fantastic horses in there with Charlatan and Nick's Go, but they're the same kind of horse so far as the running style. And something's got to give. Uh, normally, I don't pay a whole lot of uh, attention to post positions, especially in a race that's a one turn mile and eight. But I think whoever draws inside of the other is probably going to have an advantage because that'll be the horse I think that will set the pace. And, you know, then if you you know get into a match race scenario, which it, I mean, they should be miles better than anybody else is going to run in that race. So you, you can almost see it as a match race within a race with 10, 12 horses. And I think the inside horse is going to get the lead. The outside horse is going to track. And maybe that inside horse has a little bit of an advantage. But right now, flip a coin. I mean, they're both fantastic. I, I mean, I don't know how you separate the two. I mean, it could be one of those races where you don't you don't want the exact box of the two favorites. You know, even though the two fa- the two favorites lay over the are going to lay over the field most likely on speed figures. You know, it, the dynamics are such that I think you, you're going to want to try to at least beat one of them out of the exacta because there's a good chance that they hook up um, in a way that that neither horse has has experienced before um, and 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 end up you know out of, out of the money. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking Nick's go, you know, as, as great as Charlottetown has looked like I, until Nick's go goes to the front and stops, 
I'm going to, I'm going to ride with him, but, but we'll see. It'll be, it'll be, a, it'll be an interesting matchup for sure. Uh, with $20 million on the line. Joining the West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost, trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is Bloodstock Agent Extraordinaire, Liz Crow. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys. Great to have you. Great to talk to you. Obviously, you're a wealth of knowledge in the industry right now. Um, but I wanted to mention about, I think, your your biggest success, which is Mine and White Girl. Uh, Sal Kuman had some some kind words to say about you uh, as, as he was accepting the Eclipse Award for Mine and White Girl for champion older dirt female. So let's take a look at what Sal had to say. Thank you. This is great. I think the last time I spoke at one of these, the music started playing pretty quickly and I got kicked off the stage. So the good news is nobody can kick me out of my house today. Uh, I wanted to first uh, thank my partners for allowing me to represent them uh, here today. Mike Dubb, Stuart Grant, Mike Caruso, along with my other partners in Monomoy Stables. This filly's taken all of us on an incredible journey, and it's been a privilege to own her alongside a great group of partners and friends. A few other people to thank. Firstly, Brad Cox. Brad, I know how much this filly has meant to you personally and to your career. Your first grade one winner. You said to me last year, if you can win a grade one with this horse after 18 months off and all she'd been through, it would be the best training job of your career. You did it. Thank you and congratulations. You're one of the hardest working and most genuine people I've met in my life and I feel lucky to call you a friend. I wanted to thank Brad's assistants, Tessa, Jorge, Dustin, Ricky, her groom, Darwin, and her exercise riders, Fernando and Donnie. I wanted to thank Paul Sharp and his team for all the work that they've done with Monomoy Girl and many of our other horses, uh, Windstar Farm and Dr. Sutter for taking care of her during her time off. Florent, you've ridden her 14 of the 15 times she's run. You're the best. Thank you for everything. There's no way we'd be here today without you. And lastly, Liz Crow, the first ticket you signed when you branched out on your own. I wanted to read something that you wrote in a recent email. Quote, it's hard to describe how life-changing Monomoy Girl has been for everyone involved. The careers she launched, the dreams she made come true, and excitement she created every time she ran is stuff of only fairy tales and movies. I think that sums it up best. I feel lucky to have owned many great racehorses in my life, but this one is at the top of the list. Thank you, Monomoy Girl. So, you know, you've, you've picked out a lot of great horses, but I think she's she's clearly the one that you're known best for right now. Can you just talk about how gratifying it's been to see her career progress, how much personal pride you feel on that, and also how excited you are to see her keep running? Yeah, it's um, it's just been one of those amazing stories that's been, she's just, she's done so much for my career, but she's done so much for so many people's careers. I mean, if you think about where Brad Cox started um, before she came in his barn, can we all remember a time when Brad Cox didn't have a grade one winner, you know, to his name? It just seems pretty remarkable that she was the first one for him. Obviously, she was my first grade one winner as well. Um, she just puts it on the line every time. Her PPs are something that are so unbelievable to see. Um, if you if you look at them and you see the consistency, you just don't see that in horse racing very often. And um, so many fun days of the races, um, including all these owners. It's felt like family, um, just because we've we've spent so much time together rooting her on. We get, all of us get so nervous. Um, I think Brad Cox said it's the only horse he, he legs a jockey up on and he literally, his heart is just like pounding out of his chest for the entire post parade. And we all feel that way. So I think it's just been one of those stories that, um, 
it's, she's just never going to be topped for, for all of us that, that have gotten to experience um, this Philly because she was our first. And I think that's what makes it so special. And as far as Spindrift um, racing or next year, I think it's so good for racing. You know, we really need that in racing where I think people can kind of follow her story. She was a comeback story. Um, she's going to be on a lot of national television um, broadcast this year. And I hope it really helps racing fall in love with a Philly that is maybe turns into some story like a Zenyatta or a, or a Rachel where people can follow her down the road for years to come. Hey Liz, thanks for joining us. And uh, 2020 was such an unusual and, and in many ways bad year for not just horse racing, but for the world in general. And it definitely had an impact on the sales. You go to all sorts of sales, uh, yearlings, two-year-olds, uh, horses and racing age, et cetera. Um, if you could look back at 2020 and in your opinion, economically, where were the sales at? How did they do in the face of COVID? And what do you expect for 2021, you and your clients? Um, it's a great question. Um, 2020 was a really challenging year, especially for the two-year-old sales, I would say the most. Um, you know, I have a pinhook venture and we uh, I remember flying down in OBS March, landing in Atlanta and having the whole country start shutting down and going, oh my God, what am I going to do with these 14 two-year-olds, you know, that I'm going to try to sell over the next several weeks. Um, and so many sales canceling and uh, I really, the horse industry is an amazing, resilient thing because they were able to somehow get all these two-year-old sales to still happen, um, which is really just so impressive, but it was down 25% and it was down 25% across the board. So I think um, it was tough on a lot of people. A lot of Pinhook Ventures um, didn't break even, um, lost money, um, but it seems like we were able to bounce back and and have a really good November. It was almost a record breaking November sale um, with Spendthrift stepping in and buying so many horses. And I think it's going to continue to bounce back. I think it's going to take time. Um, but I, I expect, I, I feel very good about how 2021 is going to go. Liz, just to keep on the, the same topic of, of sales, um, what a lot of people don't realize when it comes to working in the sales is just how much uh, energy and how many man hours go into it. Um, you know, whether it's the Keeneland September sale where you're looking at 4,000 horses over the course of, uh, of a, you know, nine, 10 day period to the under tax shows, two year old sales where you're there, you know, looking at, at horses, you know, gallop and breeze um, for four or five straight days before you even start in on uh, looking at them back at the barns. So give us give the audience a little bit of an idea of what you look for when an athlete comes out of the barn. Um, and you're doing an analysis as to whether or not you like the way your horse's confirmation and walk look and that you would recommend, you know, to your clients to, to purchase? Well, it's also a good question. Um, well, to start, I think the most important thing for me at a sale is to be thorough. Unless I'm able to, I, I, I have a team of shortlisters um, and a team of people that help organize me at a sale. And the most important thing is that if there are 4,320 horses that we look at all those 4,320 horses and we consider all of them, um, no matter the pedigree page, um, no matter you know the consigner, the breeder, we try to go through the process on each horse and consider each horse. And that just takes, um, I was I was listening to your all's podcast with Acacia and how she prepares for a day at the races. And I think it's a similar thing of digging through and trying to be as thorough as possible so that before you even show up at the sale, you're prepared and, and you feel like, you know, what's going on. Um, as far as when an individual horse comes out, um, the first thing I like to look at is their attitude. Um, so often we can forget that these horses are not machines and, um, they're the way they act in the paddock and the post parade and loading in the gate and, you know, the way they're handled in the barn, um, all that really matters. And it's kind of what makes Monomoy Girls so unique is she's so calm and quiet. Um, she handles all of everything with so much class and um, it can be hard to assess a horse in a minute and 30 seconds of, of what you have to, to look at a horse. It's kind of like, I always say to my clients, it's like going to an NFL combine, but you can't actually do the IQ test or interview them. So your assessment is just them coming out of the barn and how they're reacting to their environment. Um, and then from there, 
I start looking at their confirmation and um, I start assessing from, you know, their hip to their shoulder, uh, to their, the way their neck sits in their shoulder. Um, and the walk to me is something a little bit overrated, especially since, I mean, when you get to go to a two-year-old sale, you get to see them gallop and breeze and the way they actually move on the track is so much more important. Um, I think a lot of people, the walk is just a way to see, do they flow well through their shoulder? Do they push off well behind? And then when they're walking at you, um, you want to make sure that they're correct enough to where, when they're going to gallop down the track, uh, breeze down the track, that, that the way they set their knees and their, their cannon bones down, um, should be a, a good and appropriate way for them to, to move through the dirt. No, that, that's excellent. Excellent explanation because a lot of people don't, you know, look at the overall package. They're immediately looking and itemizing the sources offset, looking for negatives as opposed to looking at the overall athlete and, and the way it flows. Um, just as a quick follow-up question, now that you've been doing this for a while, uh, I'm sure you have a, a book in your mind of certain family lines that you like and certain ones that you don't and certain consigners that you will and won't buy from. You don't have to name names, but is that something that goes into your um, breakdown as well? Are there certain you know family lines that you would be more encouraged to buy from and and or certain consigners that maybe you wouldn't look at um, you know because of practices that they have? Yeah, I, I think our team spends quite a bit of time actually researching that in the off season, um, two-year-old sales and the results of some of these consigners and how they have done over the years. But I try not to get myself too wrapped up in pedigree. Um, like, as you can see, like Monomoy Girl doesn't have a big pedigree. Um, British Idiom didn't have a big pedigree. Uh, of course, you'd love to get the Philly with the big pedigree but oftentimes I can't afford that. And that's kind of how I started my career was um, not being able to afford that type of, of pedigree page. So I think a lot of times, like look at the grade three winner we had in California um, this past weekend that Gary Young purchased from two-year-old sales. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's ever heard of his pedigree page um, that won the Robert B. Lewis, I believe. Um, you know, you can really get yourself wrapped up in that and and lose sight of what you're really looking for. So I try hard not to be too biased on pedigree and just allow the pedigree to tell me what the horse is going to cost and um, what I'm going to have to pay for it. Yeah, and what then, were you talking about? Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say on consigner front, um, there's definitely some consigners I love buying from that, that have had proven results. And um, I wish I could get into shouting out all of them, but I think there's some definite breeders out there that, you know, you look for like stone street being one of them. Um, when they've bred a horse, you're just, you're automatically more excited about it. I think. Yeah. We were talking about Medina spirit before and, and how rare it is to have a horse who sold for a thousand dollars be on the Kentucky Derby trail. Um, but you were talking about the start of, start of your career. And I, I wanted to dive into that a little bit. You know, I think, I think that you've had kind of a meteoric rise in, in, in the bloodstock business, honestly. And, I wanted to know about, obviously, Monomoy Girl gave you a lot of confidence, I'm sure, in her success. But I wanted to know about maybe earlier on some horses you picked out or maybe some people you ran across that had faith in you. What gave you the confidence to be able to build this so relatively quickly? Well, um, I think the the first people would be 10 Strike Racing, um, Marshall Graham and Clay Sanders. Um, they were the ones I, I met them through Pete Bradley, who I worked for previously for four years. And they said, you know, you can, you can do this and, um, we'll be there to back you. And I think everyone needs that confidence uh, of having somebody there. And, and I have to say Brad Weisford also was a big help to me. Um, you know, obviously we, we know he doesn't go to sales and pick out horses. He's more on the, um, paperwork and financial side of things and doing private deals. So he said, you know, I think you can really do this. And, I think as a young person, you need to hear confidence like that from somebody other than yourself to step out into this. Um, it's kind of a daunting world, you know, the bloodstock world um, for sure. But um, I bought Allied Air Raid was like my first two-year-old purchase at OBS June um, of all places. And he, I bought him from Paul Sharp and I didn't know Paul Sharp at the time at all. And, and now Paul breaks all our horses. He's broken mon he broke monomoy girl he broke british idiom he broke amp pearl for us um he's just been a huge part of our program so that horse is is a cool horse that hangs in my office um his picture hangs in my office and he um ran second in a bunch of stakes and and won a stake down in louisiana downs and we paid fifty thousand for him and um 
I think he's kind of one of the first horses that got me going. I bought him for 10 strike, um, my first client. So I think it's, um, it's been a fun rise and, and really it's a rise that I've enjoyed at the same time as Brad Cox. I wish I was at the level of Brad Cox with all of his grade one wins and Eclipse awards and everything. But, um, I think it's been, it's been a really amazing five years that I credit a lot to, um, those early days and those early clients. Liz, uh, one of your most, uh, excuse me, most um, important, most high visible clients is obviously Saul Kuman. And, you know, he hasn't been in the game a long time, but he's been absolutely something that everybody wants to see. A guy with a lot of money, a guy with a tremendous enthusiasm for the sport, and a guy who is, you know, that cliche, good for the game. My question is, how do we get 10 more Saul Kumans? Uh, what does the sport need to do to get these kind of people uh, that are, you know, not really paying attention to racing right now that might come in and, you know, be difference makers? Well, I thought the um, America's Day at the Races um, that we that we put on at Fox Sports 1 um, for New York Racing this um, past year with COVID you know, with Acacia and, and you have, um, Jonathan Kinchin and Andy Sterling, so many talented people that jumped on that show. And I, I really learned something every day I watched it. And I, I heard from a lot of friends around the country that didn't necessarily know a lot about racing that had kind of tuned into this and watched it. And I think if we can continue to do, you know, more podcasts and more coverage of racing and, while people are still stuck at home and still not able to go to sporting events. Um, I think it puts racing in a really good light. And I think Saul, you know, he stumbled upon horse racing when he was in college and, um, you know, just happened to go, uh, over to Pimlico when he was um, playing lacrosse. And, um, I think if, if we can put it in a way where people can stumble upon it a bit more, um, I know it's something we all struggle with is trying to think of ways to keep putting it out there. Um, I think it helps. And I think that was a really, really good show that was, was put on by them. And, um, I know even my clients enjoyed watching it that, you know, know tons about racing. And, um, so I think it's, we just have to keep putting racing in a good light. And, um, I wish we could clone Saul. <laughs> He's been so great for my business and so great for, uh, the sport in general, his enthusiasm when he's at the races and he's constantly bringing friends and, and people that have never gone to the races to the races. Um, and they're not only getting to come just to an average day of racing, they're getting in the winner's circle with justify and Monomoy girl, and, um, they turn into real fans. So I think he's so great for the game. So Liz, now, now, you know, you've been doing this for, like you said, five, six years. And in the beginning, 10 strike was your, your primary client who was backing you. Now you probably have, you know, multiple clients that are, that are uh, asking for your services. How do you, when you go to a sale, how do you like juggle that um, where you have multiple clients that are looking for horses? Cause I'm sure even the clients that want to spend a hundred thousand dollars for a horse, if you find a Medina spirit for 35,000, they would love to have on that one too. So how, how do you, you know, juggle that where you have multiple clients that for the looking for the same kind of horse? Yeah, that's become a really big challenge for me for sure. Um, because you want to be fair to everybody and especially the people that helped you get started, like Saul Cumin and like 10 strike. Um, you know, some people are not looking at every single sale, which helps, you know, you have some clients that really enjoy the two-year-old sales and some that really enjoy the yearling sales. And I think that's, um, um, that separates out my clients a little bit. And then, um, you know, I try to remind them, I don't know which ones can run. If I did know which ones could run, I would have bought Mono My Girl for myself and at least kept 10, 10 or 20% of her. Um, so I have a formula, you know, like I said, I'm very thorough and, um, I try really hard to do the best job for each person. You know, if I have somebody looking for a $50,000 Philly and one person looking for a hundred thousand dollar Colt, obviously that separates things out. Um, if somebody falls in the same price range, uh, I try to just buy my favorite, a uh, couple of Phillies and split them up, um, the best I can. And, uh, hopefully that, you know, works out, but it's, I think it's a similar problem for like a trainer that has two horses for the same spot. You know, you might have, um, you know, two Colts that fit the same Derby prep and you just have to run them against each other and, and see what happens. And, and sometimes that's just the way it goes for me too. And are you still taking on new clients at this point? Yeah, I am. Um, the great part is I can kind of talk to them and see if our goals match up. And, um, it's really important to me that the horse gets to go to a really good trainer and a really good 
um, breaking operation if it's a yearling and uh, it kind of fits our program. And we see eye to eye on, on what we're both trying to accomplish. So the great part is I've been able to just add those types of clients and, and focus on um, focus on people I enjoy spending my time with. Sounds like John Crow is John John Green is angling to be in the Liz Crow business. <laughs> I at least want to know what the opportunities are. You know me, <laughs> I'm right. an opportunist. All right. Always a schmoozer. Um, <laughs> one last one la- one last question for me. Uh, there's there's been a movement to obviously to to get away f- from drugs and racing, and that's I think that, that I've seen that branch out to the sales. You know, trying to ban clenbuterol. They're also trying to to restrict uh, surgeries in young horses. As someone who's who's on the ground and sees horses basically every day, uh, how big of a deal do you think that is, and, and and will be for the sales industry? I think it's so important. Um, I've seen it. Uh, obviously sales don't have even nearly the regulation that racing does, especially, um, you know, the two-year-old sales and the yearling, I mean, really the yearling sales too. Um, there's before really this year, it was not something that was discussed heavily. Um, I don't think a lot of people are really using, uh, that many drugs on a yearling or, um, I don't think it's as major of a problem as probably the public even perceives it to be. Um, but I think it's definitely going to help even the playing field out to some of these guys that don't over prep their horses and they don't, um, do too much at the two-year-old sales. And I think I'd love to see it level out a bit more and you kind of know the consigners that do and don't. And, and unfortunately you just have to tiptoe around those guys. And, um, I would love to see it get cleaned up a little bit more than it is. I think it's headed in the right direction. I, I really do believe um, overall, I think racing and, and drugs and everything is headed in the right direction. I feel good about it. Before we let Liz go, we know she's got a big announcement. <laughs> you want to tell the podcast world or not? It's fine. If you oh, don't. yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> today is my, my due date. I'm expecting a, a baby girl and hopefully um, she'll make her appearance very soon. <laughs> Yay. Congratulations. Thank That's you. Liz. Awesome. That's awesome. Came on, came on the show on her due date. That's yeah. amazing. Yep. That's <laughs> a good incredible. distraction while I'm waiting here. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, well, congratulations, and, and we wish you the best of luck. And, and thanks so much for for coming on and talking to us, Liz. Yeah, Thank thanks you, Liz. For me thanks, on, guys. Liz. Good luck. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Liz Crow will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that wagering through Keeneland Select supports Keeneland's efforts to give back to the thoroughbred industry. That spring meet will be here before you know it. Starts April 2nd with 18 stakes running through April 23rd. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Liz Crow, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Ritz, and our editors, Danny Seiper, Ali LaRocca, and Anthony LaRocca. Thank you so much for watching. Please wear a mask. We'll see you next week.